Hello world, this is Lisa Fredrickson, your friend and professor from Johnson County Community College. And in this short screencast, we're going to debrief on chapter four, which is about debugging and error handling techniques. So there's a great deal of material in chapter four that is very valuable. What you're looking at is the solution to chapter four. By the time you get done with chapter four, your web page will recommend a tractor that's appropriate for the choices made in these. Some of the decisions are based off of the number of acres that are cultivated. If we get beyond 5,000 acres, then we go for a bigger machine. Some of the choices are based on what crops you grow, and some of the decision-making is based on how many months you are working, as well as your preferred fuel source. And you'll see that as I choose standard diesel, it's a D. Biodiesel, I go with the B version, and E85, I don't think we could get a big tractor that would run on E85, but if we could, that particular model would show up here in the recommendations area. Work is done. You will see changes in the recommendation based on all these different choices. So at this point, let's take a high-level look at the code as well as the HTML. And here's our external JS file, tuba.js. It is declaring some variables, some global variables here at the top to set the acres complete, crops complete, months complete, and fuel complete variables to true. We're also setting some global variables for the sidebar H2 and P elements, which is these two areas of the form. Here's the heading and here's the paragraph. We're also setting global variables referencing the field set elements. And remember when we use get elements by tag name plural and we're referencing an element, we have to reference the order that we encounter it in the HTML. And these elements start referencing themselves with zero, just like arrays. So if we look at our HTML, we have one, two, three, four field sets that relate to these one, two, three, four areas of our form. So the author has done a very good job of indenting the code and styling it so that those field sets are really visible. We have yet more global variables for the text input elements, the months box, and the acres box. And here we're going to reference the first form, we find the months there, and we find the acres right here. And for these two statements, I put an alternative way of stating that, that you might be more familiar with right below those statements. Those two statements mean the same thing. They mean to get the value out of the months box and set it to this variable months box. So whether you reference that value using the months property of the forms, the first form object of the document, or whether you use the value property of the get element by ID method of the document, those two things mean the same thing. The author is just showing you two ways of grabbing the value out of the acres box and out of the months box. And this particular function is determining if the text box entry is a positive number. If acres box, which we've declared as a variable up here, dot value is greater than zero. And again, remember that they're declaring these variables simply so they don't have to use the long reference, the long JavaScript reference to that specific item. It just makes their code shorter down in the rest of the JavaScript file. So we verify that the acres text box is a positive number. We throw a message if it's not true. We can catch that message and use this error handling code that's taught in the last part of chapter four. We are also verifying that at least one of the crops checkboxes is checked. We're verifying that the text entry in the months is between one and 12 and using some error handling code there to catch any errors and throw messages at the user if they should break the rules. We're verifying that the fuel option button is selected, that the form is complete using ampersand, ampersand, that means acres complete must be true and crops complete must be true and months complete must be true and fuel complete must be true. If all of that is true, then we're gonna run the create recommendation function. And that's what really determines which tractor we're recommending. So there's a lot of code here. You will be practicing your if statements with the true test, your else if statements, 
you'll see four loops. The for loop has three parts behind it. You'll be writing a lot of curly braces because we have a lot of if, else, if clauses, as you can see here. And we have wonderful event listeners to reset the page when it loads, as well as event listeners for all input elements, so that as I change my numbers, the JavaScript is listening for that change and making a change in my recommended tractor. So that's where this project is going. Let's break down some of those specific debugging techniques a little bit further. I think the first and foremost debugging technique is simply trying not to make bugs in the first place. And so that's why I've been such an advocate for excellent indentation on both your HTML, look how beautifully this is indented, as well as your JavaScript. When you keep the files in separate files, you can use its color coding techniques to identify the HTML elements in blue, attributes of course are in red, attribute values are in purple, text is in black, comments in HTML are in green as they are in JavaScript. So just keeping your code in separate files allows Notepad++ to deploy all their color coding techniques that help you prevent errors in the first place. Indentation so that we can see our curly braces, so that we can clearly see our semicolons at the end of our JavaScript lines is also just essential ways for you to help yourself. It's also considered good form to put a space before and after all operators, although that's not technically required by JavaScript, and comments to indicate what is going on in the file at that point in time are extremely helpful as you come back and you try to debug this code. But some of the other techniques that the book tells you about are wonderful as well. Window.alert can be used at any time in your code to identify the value of a variable. And if you are just wanting to know the value of a variable in a little window, you simply put the variable name inside the parentheses for the alert method of the window. That's very easy. You can do the exact same thing with console log, which some people prefer because console log, instead of putting a little window, will log that value down here to the console so that it won't go away. You won't have to respond to it in a little window in the browser and you can see the value of that variable in your console. The book also takes you through the debugger tab, which is wonderful. It'll tell you when it encounters an error in your JavaScript and specifically where that line is so that you can go back and look for that error and fix that error. So those skills that the book teaches are just essential. The book also gets into some more advanced skills such as tracing your errors with the inspector and almost every inspector, Internet Explorer, Firefox, and Chrome have these inspector panels. Firefox led the way with a product, an add-in called Firebug, but now all popular browsers have these wonderful tools so you can use all of them. They all work a little bit differently, but they all pretty much have the same information. The last part of chapter four gets into error handling code. Try, catch, and finally. It does add quite a bit of code to your function, but is considered essential if you want to bulletproof your code. Now that goes beyond the scope of JavaScript 1, the class we're in right now, and we'll pick that up and review that in JavaScript 2, Web 124 when you get there. So slog through this chapter, learn it, go as slow as you can, definitely learn about window alert, console log, and using the inspector, beautifully indented and organized code in the first place. You'll have a lot fewer errors to debug later. Thank you.